Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and holy crap, all I could think about was that I wish I was back on vacation in Paris, drinking beer at a cafe, eating snails, and not thinking about real life. That trip and that place was so incredible, and I miss it much more than I thought I would. So much that I'm using our Duolingo family plan, and I'm going to learn the language, go back in a few years for a few months, and really enjoy some extended time over there. If you haven't been to Paris, know that I really didn't want to go. I heard that Parisians were rude and not helpful, and I found things to be completely opposite. Everyone was helpful and wanted to show us a great time. I say that, but at the same time, I really didn't have one meaningful conversation with the Parisian over there, and I still loved it. I highly recommend that everyone check out Paris at least once. When we returned from the vacation, it was all about getting back to real life, scrambling to get podcasts out, and way more important than that, getting Anne's back into her cancer treatment. So when I left, we decided to roll the dice and take a month off of chemotherapy so Anne's wouldn't have the terrible side effects that she's been experiencing during our trip. And that kind of worked out. I mean, she still had side effects, but they weren't as bad. And now that we're back, we've moved on to a radiation-based treatment. The treatment this time is something called the CyberKnife. Hopefully, it's way more impressive and productive than a Cybertruck. This expensive piece of machinery is supposed to blast Stange's cancer with lasers. She has five treatments over six days, and by the time you hear this, she should be done. The good news is that the doctor thinks there's a 90% chance that he'll be able to get rid of it all. The bad news is, we've heard similar forecasts like this before, and they didn't work out. What we know for certain is that when we get done radiation, we wait two weeks and then we go back to chemotherapy. Ant has already done 24 rounds of chemo, so as you can imagine, she's not looking forward to doing it again, but she has to. After three months of chemo, we're going to do another scan to see if the radiation killed the shit it was supposed to, and if it's dead, I think that means that Ant should be considered cancer-free again. And if not, Well, we'll most likely need to find new doctors and treatments in another city. This whole thing has been so tough to deal with. Watching Anne's go through all of the surgeries and treatments, it's so sad. And then knowing that she's always thinking about dying is even sadder. I hope that you and yours never have to go through anything like this. But cancer is a big part of my life these days. Another part that's pretty big is this podcast. I can't believe I've gone over 375 weeks without missing an episode. There are other podcasts out there claiming to be skiing's first. But this is the longest continually running podcast in snow. And based on the reviews and emails I get, this is by far the best. So thank you to everyone for listening each week. This week's episode is with another living legend, but one who hasn't gotten the respect that he's due. Dane Tudor has won skiing's highest honor, performance of the year twice. And he's been consistently one of the most progressive backcountry skiers in the business. But for some reason or another, sponsors and the financial part of skiing have always been difficult for Dane. And in the podcast, I try to find out why. Before we get into it, I want to ask you to tell a friend about the show and ask you to review me wherever you listen. Both of those things really do help the show grow. Finally, I want to ask you to listen to my sponsor ads and buy from them. I only work with the best brands, and they are Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Outdoor Research, Elon Skis, Best Day Brewing, and Stanley. Now, let's talk with Dane Tudor. You've always been into fitness and you've had your weigh the meats phase. You've had your count your calories phase. And these days you're doing a lot of swimming, it sounds like. And is it true that you're a speedo and flipper type guy? (laughs) Well, uh, A plus on the research there. Yeah, I have a mixed training routine. So I lift weights in the gym. I swim. Those are like my two main routine core aspects. And then, you know, ride bicycle, ride motocross run a little bit and, you know, sled and ski as well. Has the gym always been part of your routine? Because there's a lot of people that skip the gym until maybe 26 and then kind of got into that and like the cardio of it. How about yourself? I got into gym training after my injury in 2013. Okay. That was really when I started doing some CrossFit and things like that. And then throughout the years, I just kind of picked it up at different times and, you know, stayed relatively consistent, but it's kind of an up and down wave. Well, I just really wanted to bring that up in the intro because I heard Speedo and whenever I do, I how many Speedos do you own? (laughs) Well, it's a, what are they called? It's not like a Speedo. They're like Speedo shorts. They're like 
tight, but not Speedos. Oh, man, I was imagining a total Speedo, which would have been way more funny. But we don't have to talk about Speedos or any of that. We're going to talk about your upbringing. And it's an interesting one. And while I know your dad is no longer with us, were your folks pretty much big adventurers and skiers like before you came along? Yeah, for sure. My dad was a big skier. He grew up in Juneau, Alaska. The stories that I know of in many ways is he was a pretty rad guy and he was rocking a helmet cam way back in the day before I was born. So okay. I definitely think he was kind of on the forefront of the free ski movement in Alaska and, you know, unfortunately died when I was three. So didn't really get to progress through the eras. And then my mom, she was big into skiing. She left home around 18 and started traveling and she went over to New Zealand and got started skiing there. And she met a guy named Jim Gove and uh, he was a photographer. So they ended up traveling the world and doing adventure ski trips together. So your mom ends up in Alaska at some point and gets pregnant by your dad. And I think the really interesting part about it is like, it's the most ski bum thing you could possibly do is you get on a plane from Alaska to go back to Australia because you can't pay what it's going to be to have a baby in Alaska. And you're born in Australia. Is that pretty much why that happened? Uh, it definitely didn't have to do with that. Uh you know, financial means she actually wanted me to be a dual citizen, both American and Australian. So that was the main purpose. Okay. And is there a fun story of like her water broke on the plane or some crazy shit that you've heard your whole life? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Her water broke on the plane. I mean, that's pretty classic to be flying close to, you know, having a child. So her water broke and she managed to make it to Australia. And I think I was born within, you know, 24 hours of landing in Oz. That's crazy because these days they don't want you flying like three or four weeks before you are having a baby. And it's crazy that she was flying 24 hours before she had her baby. But everything works out. And are you pretty much just in Australia for like the birth in a few months and then you're back on a plane to Alaska? Yeah, I think uh, we didn't spend a whole lot of time there. Uh, there's pictures of me here in Roslyn in Canada when I was, you know, pretty fresh. So I'm not sure if we went straight to Alaska or to Canada or exactly how it played out. but. It was mixed between Alaska, Canada, and Australia there in my first years of life. Okay. And you're put on skis when you're two years old, but at three is when your dad passes away. And I hate to ask, but what happened? He was involved in a drunk driving car accident on oh. Kodiak Island in Alaska. Oh, man, I'm sorry. So I'm sure you don't really remember much about your dad, but looking back on your life and times from like a 30,000 foot view today, have you figured out how not having a dad impacted your life, especially in those like important childhood years? Yeah, well, it's definitely interesting and something I've thought about a little bit over the years. And at the time, my mom and dad, they were split up actually and having challenging times together. So looking at it and thinking of the possibility that I may have been going between two homes and my dad being from Juneau, there is a lot more drinking and drugs and stuff that goes on in Juneau. I have other family members there, aunts and uncles and stuff like that, and they've had a pretty rough go of it. And so my mom's been amazing and she's really supported me throughout my life and the aspects and career choices that I've chosen. So I think things really have turned out for the better. And, you know, that's kind of a hard thing to think about in some ways, maybe for some people, but, you know, my life's been good. So you know, I always miss my dad and it'd be cool to have known him, but it is what it is. Yeah. So it sounds like you spend your summers in Alaska, the rest of the year in Roslyn, Canada. You know, I get your dad's the Alaska connection and your mom's like an Australian connection. How do you end up spending most of your life in Canada? What's the connection there? Well, I grew up in Alaska in the summer and Canada in the winter until I was around probably 20. And then I started spending more time either in Canada or Oregon and kind of coming back to Canada, stuff like that. But my mom, she also, throughout her travels, she ended up in both Alaska and here in Roslyn, BC in Canada. So she really created roots in those two places. And that's how I ended up here. So you grow up 10 minutes from Red Mountain. Red is pretty much different than anywhere else, I feel like. Can you describe how Red's different? Yeah, so it's funny. Red is really close to Roslyn. It's like five minutes drive from town. And, you know, growing up, there was no major development at the base. It was super old school style ski club. And it was really, in a sense, rickety looking back on it. And when I started traveling and going to places like Keystone and Crested Butte, different locations like that, I was really like, where is the mountain? I was so used to growing up in a place where the mountain was just a five minute drive and there was no buildings at the base. 
to go into a place like Keystone and, you know, you park in the back and I didn't have a clue where I was going. I'm walking through this village being like, where the hell is the base of the ski hill? So that was pretty confusing for me at first. With your skiing, you start at the Nancy Green, which is like recreational type racing. It's like entry level for kids in Canada. And when you're put in a race program and being that you have a history of parents who are great skiers, do you do well from the get-go? Yeah, for sure. I don't really remember a lot of Nancy Green, to be honest, but I definitely was a, a top skier there. And I believe my mom was pushing to get me into Red Mountain Racers probably a year early just because, you know, my skiing skills were pretty advanced. And what's interesting is you, you're a promising ski racer and you have a normal life, but then in fourth grade, you start homeschooling. And what's the reason for that? The primary reason from my mom's perspective was that she traveled back and forth from Alaska to Canada. And that was difficult, I think, for her to be having me switch schools in between the school season. And also she said it that you know, she looks back on it and thinks, was that something that was a little selfish on her part? Because she wanted to have the freedom to be able to move around. And when I look at it, I'm pretty happy that I was homeschooled. Going to school, it was quite challenging for me switching schools and different curriculums. And being homeschooled just enabled me more time to ski and ride dirt bikes and stuff like that. So I'm happy with how it turned out. When you do that, though, and you're kind of away from the rest of the world a lot, I would think, I guess when you go to the ski hill every day, that makes it a little bit different. But does it have an impact on your social life? Like, are you strange or socially awkward because you're not around a lot of kids all the time? Yeah, I mean, that would be debatable for sure. You know, I'm more of an introverted person. I think I've always been like that. I would say that, sure, I w would have missed out on stuff like prom and school dance parties and things like that. But at the same time, I got to go to the ski hill and I was hanging out with older people and learning from them and progressing my skiing skills and still having a social life that just wasn't hanging out with kids my age. It sounded like you had like one or two kids your age. It sounds like Colston was homeschooled as well and you guys were able to ski every day. Was that pretty much the way school was? Was like you do school in the morning with mom and then you'd be able to go to the hill the rest of the day and shred? So usually if it was a pow day, then I'd just go skiing and I'd do school when I get home. And yeah, Colston, he's a good friend of mine. We still hang out and ski together and he was homeschooled as well. So he and I would just be up on the hill filming each other, jumping off cliffs and stuff like that. And the thing about skiing at that time, like the late 90s, is the whole industry was changing. It was going from like turtlenecks to park pipe free skiing. And you started out as a ski racer. And do you remember the coming of the new school? Do you remember seeing that happen at the hill? I guess I would say that we were probably the second generation of that happening. So I had some guys that I looked up to. Kevin Irwin, Donovan Skelton, Aaron Alabone, to name a few. And James Heim as well was in that group. Okay. And they had made a movie called Instability. And that was the first movie I ever watched that showcased free skiing and tricks and all that kind of action. And that really was a pivotal moment for me being like, wow, that is so cool. And from there, I started seeing Matchstick and TGR and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'd say we were the second wave of the new school generation. And while you're probably enjoying racing, are you that race kid that heads to the terrain park in spandex when you have a free lap? And are you into that side of the sport completely as well? Yeah, totally, for sure. When I was ski racing, we had a small park here at Red. We still have a small park. I wouldn't say that it's much, but I was ski racing, doing big mountain contests. And on days that we were training, if it was slushy out or whatever, I would totally bomb into the park in my race suit and hit some rails and stuff and probably was all cocky about it. And how about on pow days? Were you skipping out on race practice to go drop cliffs and do shit like that? Definitely tried my best to do that. Usually it would turn out that, you know, we'd get like 20 centimeters of snow and I would bitch and moan about it and we'd go up and they'd set the course and we'd slip the course and I'd be like, well, I don't know why we're doing this because they're just going to let us go because it's not safe with the amount of snow berms that are building up. And that's usually what they would let us do on a pow day. So I'd end up getting to go skiing after all that was said and done. Okay. And when you're a homeschooled kid without two parents at home, do you get your self-worth and your self-confidence from your skiing talent and moto, which we're going to talk about in a minute as well? Yeah, for sure. I guess so. I hadn't really thought about my self-worth really being put on one thing in particular, but definitely being a good athlete and a high-profile skier is good for the confidence level for sure. The best way for you to gain even more confidence, especially when you're a good skier, for better or for worse, is to give them sponsorship. And I think that happens really, really young for you. 
how old were you when Solomon, when the whole Solomon sponsorship thing happened? I think I was around 12. And how did that all come together? Growing up ski racing, I was on Rossignol and I was a big Rossi fan, you know, maybe back in the day, Tanner Hall was riding Rossi, that kind of stuff, the Pow Air. Yeah. And that's what I was skiing on at the time. And we were at a ski race at Whitewater, which is just outside of Roslyn and the town Nelson there. And there was a Solomon ski test going on. And my mom just goes over there and asks them for the contact info for the team manager or for a rep or whatever. That's how we got the contact and reached out to a guy named Scott Jewett, who uh, is still around. He's worked for Red Bull and quite a few other like film companies and stuff like that. He's all over the place. He's got a couple of kids now that are big into the bike world. So we just reached out to Scott and made that connection and ended up meeting him in Whistler after I'd won the provincial championships. Was that yet? I can't quite remember all the timeline, but yeah, Scott hooked it up with like a grassroots sponsorship with like a pair of skis per year and discounted race skis. So it's pretty awesome to get on board and really loved being on the Solomon team. And the thing about Solomon was every discipline was covered and they had like the best of the best, it seemed like in every different aspect. So a lot of kids could get lost in that program. I'll bring that up a little bit later. But it sounds like you being on Solomon and just the way that you were like the best kid at your mountain growing up, did it get to your head? Like I heard you were kind of a punk kid who had like a, wouldn't even call it confidence back then. It was more cocky and eventually it became confidence. Would that be fair to say? You know, it's so hard to know for sure because... That was so long ago. And I think people can take confidence or being cocky in, you know, their own way. And so like parents would be like, oh, Dane, he won't even like say hi or whatever when I would see them at the hill or something. But to be quite honest, I was just super shy. I know that definitely I had a lot of energy when I was younger and, you know, would mess around with the kids and stuff and whatever. I had confidence for sure. Maybe I was cocky. I don't really know. But um, I think I've always been a pretty nice chill kid at heart so it's hard to say i mean were you a kid getting in fights at all no definitely not i'm not a fighter how about a hockey temperate contests or races like freaking out when you didn't do well did that happen yeah definitely i had one moment at crested butte where i definitely had a little freak out after i was in first place in the adult division and came down and did a punch front flip on my last run and i had a big lead and they ended up putting me in third and I had a little bit of a childish moment there, as any young kid would, that put a lot of energy into wanting to be the best and win the contest in their first year as an adult. You know, those things happen. I don't think it really means that, you know, we're a bad person or anything like that. No, no, not at all. But how did your coaches deal with you back then? I mean, when I hear cocky and stuff, and I heard it from a couple different people, I didn't hear it like terrible. And I've also heard that nowadays, that's not even like close. Now you like mentor kids in the backcountry. But how would you describe yourself? Because it seems like you're acknowledging that maybe there was some kind of attitude or cockiness, but it's hard to put into words and I don't want to put it into words. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't know because I only know myself from the inside and I don't know how people take things. Everybody takes things differently. And I would say that, sure, I had an essence of maybe some cockiness back in the day. But like if I was to look around at other kids, I would say that my level of cockiness personally was incredibly low compared to what could be okay and some of the other kids that i've been around for sure and even to this day there's definitely a much higher level of confidence or cockiness out there okay well you become the provincial champion as a teenager which you kind of alluded to you raced in a few fist races that looked like it was pretty much it for ski racing when i was looking into results why was that were you just burnt out on it yeah well ski racing was something more that my mom wanted for me and she put me in i was actually listening to your podcast earlier with logan peota and our parents basically had us in racing for the exact same reason, which is that, you know, you need to ski race because it's going to create a strong fundamental base for your skiing technique and skill. And just like Logan was saying, you can really tell the people that grew up ski racing and the people that didn't, like it just takes one second to look at their skiing style and you could know for sure. And yeah, I really enjoyed ski racing. And I'm competitive, so no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to go for the top. And I did well in ski racing, and um, I had been watching a lot of free ski films, and that was really where my heart was at. And when it came down to FIS, after I'd won the K2 Provincial Championships in my final year as a K2 skier, I moved to FIS, and I did one FIS race. And 
you know, I hadn't really grown all the muscle and I was kind of a smaller kid and I was in the back of the pack and going from winning K2 provincials to, you know, really struggling on a much more aggressive icy course against guys that had legs like tree trunks. I wasn't competitive at that time, not to say that I couldn't have become competitive, but my heart wasn't in it. My mind wasn't in it. I was fully ready to go filming and that's what I wanted to do. It's time for my first sponsor break, and I'm going to start things out with Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Summer is right around the corner, and based on the past couple of years, it's going to get really, really hot. And getting in the water is the perfect way to enjoy the heat. But you need to do it right, and Peter Glenn is your one-stop shop for all of your needs this summer. Think wakeboard, water ski, kneeboard, tubes, swimwear. They have everything to make your summer more fun and functional. Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the products, a knowledgeable staff, a best-in-class website if you can't make it into their stores, and a low price guarantee. That's right. If you find a lower price on a product that Peter Glenn is selling at a reputable dealer, call up Peter Glenn, let them know that price, they will match that for you. That really does help support the show by buying from Peter Glenn, and they're going to give you free shipping on orders of $50 or more. Peter Glenn isn't one of those big guys trying to take over the industry. They're the mom and pop shop that you've trusted to get your gear you need at the best prices for over 70 years. To find out more, head on over to peterglenn.com. Next up, it's outdoor research. And I've been using OR products since I moved to Seattle almost 25 years ago because they outperform everything on the market. I mean, outdoor research builds products to perform in the wet, soggy, cold weather of the Pacific Northwest. And when you live where we do, you need to have the best in class. And that's what OR's always been. While OR's always been known for building the industry-leading gear for mountaineers, and they still do that, over the past few years, they've been focusing on working with their A-list athletes in the ski and snowboard world to create new fits and kits for the snow scene, which everyone has seen on X Games podiums and on legends like Mark Abma. And now, OR is launching its freewheel mountain bike collection, and there's no cutting corners here either. Well, I could tell you about it. Here's what the folks at Freehub Magazine had to say about what OR is doing in bike. Outdoor research, with its legacy rooted in scientific inquiry and a passion for the outdoors, has once again raised the bar, offering riding gear that's not just functional, but also stylish and durable. The meticulous designs and thoughtful engineering of the Freewheel Collection have the power to transform the mountain biking experience. Reviews don't get much better than that, and to see all the new products that OR has, head on over to OutdoorResearch.com. My final sponsor this round is Best Day Brewing, and while I love the taste of a good beer, I don't always need the alcohol. I mean, my life revolves around driving my kid places, running errands, interviewing people, and all of these things I do better when I don't have a head full of alcohol. These days, when I'm not partying, I still like to enjoy an ice cold beer, and that's where Best Day Brewing comes into play. I love their hazy IPA, the Colts that you can get on all Alaska airline flights, their Electro Lime Cerveza, which is the first Mexican style NA beer that I've loved, and their new white Belgian style. They're all just so amazing and have just as much flavor as any alcoholic beer you're going to find. And they average about 60 calories a beer, and they won't get you in trouble. That's when I'm not partying. And when I am partying, I mix in a few best days throughout the night, and I found that by doing that, I can stay out until last call. You should try it. To have the best day or night ever, head on over to bestdaybrewing.com and get 15% off your first order. And if you make that order over $50, We'll throw in free shipping. You can thank me later. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. One thing that I haven't brought up was motocross. And you would spend your summers in Palmer, Alaska racing moto. And was it like skiing where you were on the podium every weekend and you had a shit ton of trophies for moto? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Alaska, you'd be surprised, actually has a pretty wicked motocross racing circuit. They do uh, city races, which are just local races, and state races, which are statewide. And I quickly climbed the ranks there, started on 80cc motorcycles and went up to 125 two-stroke or 250cc four-stroke bikes. And I went from basically a novice 80 rider up to 80 expert. And then I went from 125, 250 intermediate up to 250 expert and the pro class there. And again, I'm super competitive. So I always had my sights set on the top and I was chasing down the top guys and Again, you know, I ended up with certain people that didn't like me because they'd been out there racing for a longer period of time and having a young kid come up and just slot himself in there and become the next fast rider doesn't really go over well with everybody as they start to get uh, beat, which, you know, that happens to all of us. When that happens, do they start taking you out and stuff and kind of like more rubbing his racing on the course? It could happen. We didn't have too much like super dirty riding, but 
definitely more from the I don't know if bullying is really the right word, but a bit more just like kind of verbal comments. What did you like better when you were growing up? Was it skiing or moto? Man, I love both for sure. I have really great memories of racing motocross in Alaska. And I also have great memories ski racing and doing big mountain comps. So overall, they're both super fun. And I'm glad that I have done both and still do both. To figure out if you're going to make it to that next level in motocross, I feel like when you're in Alaska, if you want to get to the next level in motocross, I would think it's going to the lower 48 and racing in the, the main series that's in California. And I think at 15, you take a year off of skiing and you move to California to see what it takes. Was that the goal? Like, hey, I'm going to go pro in moto? Yeah, for sure. That was the goal. My mom and I went down there and stayed there for a winter. And I actually didn't ski at all except for going to Crested Butte to do the big mountain contest that I've been winning every year for a few years. So we showed up there and I competed and was super sick, ended up winning the event and went straight back to Cali to continue racing. And Cali is pretty crazy, like the level of riders there and the different style of tracks. Yeah, it's just a lot different than racing in Alaska. And so I kind of went from the top of the totem pole in Alaska to the bottom of the totem pole in California. And I don't know how much of it is a confidence thing when it really comes down to it. I don't excel really on super ruddy tracks and motocross is quite ruddy for the most part. So I went from like riding expert and pro class to riding the novice class or the C class, they call it in California. And again, I imagine that I definitely could have worked my way up and I had only spent a short period of time down there, but there was just a lot of risk involved. I'd see kids that would be taken away in stretchers, you know, an ambulance at big races or kids are dying or paralyzed and all this stuff. And there's also so much money involved in the sport. And between those two aspects, I looked at it and I was just like, I don't know if this is really the way for me right now. I didn't really have any, you know, big sponsors that were offering any free equipment or anything like that. So I just thought it would be better to go back to skiing where I was more established and I was winning events. So you mentioned you're winning events and you won the U.S. Extreme, the juniors, three years in a row, which is insane. And when you get to Crested Butte for that first Extremes, what's it like being in that environment with like all the heavy hitters? Is that intimidating? For the first year, definitely, I think I was probably right at the bottom of the age bracket. And I just remember showing up there and being like, okay, these are the guys that won last year. So I've got my eyes out for who won. And I don't remember what I qualified, maybe 10th or something like that. I have no idea. But ended up winning the event. And I guess it just comes down to the same thing as I'm super competitive. And I've got my eye on the top and I'm going to do whatever it takes to put myself up there. Who are the names that you're competing against in those three years that you win? Because I would think it's all like the big names of today. Honestly, the only uh, Tyler Sicanti was there. Yeah, I remember Tyler. And Tony, what's Tony's last name? Parody. He passed away in an avalanche in Vail. Was it Seibert, was it? Yeah, Tony Seibert. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two really that I remember. There was some other guys for sure, but my memory is kind of vague sometimes. And how about the big guns that were there for like the adult contest? Are you there to see the, the real extremes as well? Not that yours wasn't real, but were you there to see the U.S. <laughs> extremes from the adult level? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I competed one year in the adult division, but as juniors, we would still ride pretty much the same lines that the adults would, except for one day there's hourglass. And I can't remember what this other section is called. It's like a permanently closed area and the adults get to ride this one area where it's much steeper, it sloughs more and there's some big cliffs and that's close to the juniors. But otherwise, for the three years that I did the juniors, we're pretty much skiing the same faces. Again, I, oh, I don't remember. There was one guy, Gary. Gary's Gap. I don't know if that was his name. I remember watching him do the Gap on the final day in the permanently closed area. When I was in the adult division, I came and hit that same Gap. Are the Seths there and people like that where kind of your heroes growing up are actually there in person? You can actually see them and like, holy shit, I've made it. Yeah, so Seth was there, Seth Morrison. He was my idol at the time. I had dyed my hair black, all that stuff. <laughs> he actually wasn't competing, but I spotted him skiing down beside the course one day. And I ended up getting to meet him during the awards, which was, yeah, super cool. So you win the contest three years in a row. There's a line that you ski in like 2005, which blows everybody's mind and people still talk about it. But when you go on trips like this, it kind of brings everyone from the same tribe together and a lot of strangers make friends that'll last forever. 
but it sounds like you're kind of a little bit shy and maybe more the loner type. On those events, when you go to places like that, are you mingling with everybody or are you just kind of on the fringes watching? I mean, I definitely hung out with the kids that I was competing with for sure. Like I mentioned, Tyler and Tony and some of those other guys. But in general, I'd say I'm a bit more on the fringe. I'm just focused on what I'm doing. And if you're just at a contest for like a couple of days, you can only meet so many people. But the people that I did meet, you know, I still know Tyler and would know Tony still if he was around. Totally, totally. And then when you think about it, if you have to pick your favorite people to travel with to go on a ski trip, who are the people that go on your bucket list? If you have like a film trip, you have three seats in a heli, who are you bringing? I don't even know if I could answer that. I've skied with so many rad skiers over the years and it's just like pretty broad, I guess. Like if I wanted to ski big lines like Ian Mack and Sage and if I wanted to do more like trick based stuff, Sammy and, you know, Kai is a crazy big mountain rider as well. So Kai Peterson, Logan Peota for sure, Nick McNutt to name a few. Okay. And so at this point in life, you've had race, you've had the extreme contest phase. And your next focus seems to be on park and starting to do well at slope style and rail jam type events. And I wouldn't think this just happens. Do you make a calculated decision to start learning tricks and competing? Well, yeah, for sure. So basically growing up and skiing Big Mountain and ski racing and riding our local park, I was always practicing tricks and trying tricks off of cliffs and stuff like that. And when I started filming... I could basically do a 360 and a switch five and a seven. And that was for the journal with theory three. And then I moved into PVP. And again, that same kind of trick list, I'd say like switch five, seven, three, I don't know, maybe a flat spin. Yeah, that would be kind of my trick base at that point. And so I was going to the park to learn tricks, to do them in the backcountry. And also really, I'd say that my main competitive aspect like when i got into competing in park the main purpose behind it was i was hoping to do well and gain sponsors to continue doing more filming in the backcountry just because looking around at my peers that seemed to be the guys that were doing well and getting energy drink sponsors and stuff like that we're getting it from the park contests yeah i mean it seems like the way that people do things other than yourself is that they compete 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 until they get to a level where they can quit competing altogether and just focus on filming. Your story's a little bit different, and we're going to talk about that, but there was no real goal for, like, X Games or even Olympics in the future. It was just, like, you wanted to take those tricks to the backcountry. That's why you were learning them? Yeah, for sure. I wanted to take the tricks to the backcountry, and I definitely had a goal for X Games, and I also had a goal briefly for the Olympics, but at the same time, that was kind of like the Olympics goal was when my park riding in some ways was petering out a bit as far as my focus was concerned. And I'd been practicing park, and I'd been doing some slope comps, and I'd been committing my time to do tour and stuff like that. And since I didn't grow up in the park, I was still kind of off the back end a little bit as far as my skill set compared to guys like Bobby Brown and Sammy Carlson and stuff. Like I just wasn't as consistent. Like my trick base was definitely growing. I was doing both way dubs and whatnot, but I was struggling a bit definitely on the confidence aspect and just putting together the runs and also rails were never super strong for me. So that was another aspect of my runs that I would be pretty nervous about. And I just was like, you know what, this isn't really who I am as a skier like I want to go filming and I was still filming every winter like the park stuff just took up a small portion of the beginning of the season but I just decided to go back to continuously filming and not really focusing on slope style stuff okay and now I'm going to start talking a little bit about sponsorship stuff so you're crushing it with everything that you're doing in skiing pretty much and then with sponsorship is this around the time that you start making money with Solomon I started making money with Solomon the first year that I filmed with Theory 3 for the journal. So 2007, 8? Yeah. So you start getting paid then, and we're going to get to that point. So I'm a little behind it, but that doesn't really matter. We'll just say we're at 2007, 8. How about Scott? Do you have them for goggles and poles at that point? I think Scott came on board for the PVP year. I think it. Okay. You've got Scott paying you. You've got Solomon paying you. Who else is paying you at that point? That was it. I don't know if even Scott was paying at the time. It was just uh, Solomon. But doesn't that evolve to like Skull Candy and other brands sponsoring you? I did get on board with Skull Candy briefly. I didn't get paid anything. Honestly, the amount of uh, companies and managers that I've talked to and 
the sponsorships that have actually come to fruition for the level of skier that I am, I think has been pretty low. Okay. I mean, so I guess let's look at this in a different way. How much is the most that you think you've ever been able to make from a year of just skiing without any other work? Are you able to make 50 to 80 grand skiing? Yeah, for sure. More than that? Maybe with contest winnings, I might, but yeah, I don't think beyond 80,000 US dollars. And then with contests for you, I mean, the, the stuff that you do these days, it's like, other than the rad kind of bougie Red Bull Cold Rush type events, you don't really do that many contests anymore. You won that thing in 2012, but we've kind of alluded to what you're going to get into is filming. And how do you connect with Jeff Thomas, the guy behind Theory 3 Productions? And do you have to sell him on like filming you or does Solomon take care of that for you? So just to kind of clarify, I definitely was involved in competing at that time. Like I didn't really stop competing like you mentioned red bull cold rush things like that like those specialty contests i really enjoyed doing and that i did those well into uh 2012 i guess you could say and as far as filming with jeff basically like growing up as a kid like i said i looked up to aaron alabone who created instability which was the local film and they had gone out and filmed in whistler and that was my aaron was my connection to jeff thomas so aaron he actually ended up passing away after instability. And so then I kind of keep doing my thing and I'm still a junior at that time. And I reach out to Jeff Thomas and I say, Hey, I want to come out and film with you. And I contact Solomon and I tell him I want to film with Jeff Thomas. And I really push that fully. So you're one of those guys that you're going to call the team manager and let him know what you want. Like you're advocating for yourself, what you need to do in this business. Absolutely. You go out and film that for that Theory 3 year, and that's journal. And what do you learn about filming that first year? Because I feel like it was pretty good for you because it's like you're in the minor leagues in the first year with Jeff and Theory 3, but then he graduates and he starts working with Poor Boys, which is like the biggest film company in the planet for the new school of skiing, I feel like. And you're in that in year two. So do you learn a lot of shit in year one that you're able to apply to the rest of your career? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it was kind of just like the perfect moment, really, when things align. So filming with Jeff for the first year at Theory 3 was really just like kind of my initiation year. I bought a snowmobile, learned how to ride a little bit, got stuck, all that kind of stuff. And we were riding in the Whistler backcountry, which is amazing for learning. It's a lot of big rolling alpine and not super technical, at least where we were going. Yeah, just, you know, doing all these things that I wanted to do for the first time, doing big threes off cliffs, kind of just breaking into the scene. And then the next year, moving up with Jeff to PVP was like a dream come true in a sense that I'd been watching Poor Boys my whole life. And to be able to film with PVP was just huge. And I think I was just a kid in the moment, enjoying it and learning and doing all the tricks that I'd wanted to do and pursuing my passion. And that's just how it went. And I was super lucky to have the opportunity at that time. Yeah, I mean, it all lined up because Johnny calls Jeff and he says, hey, I want you to work with me on every day is a Saturday. So Jeff kind of steps up to the big leagues. Not that he wasn't big leagues, but the distribution that Johnny has was way more than what Jeff had at the time. So Jeff steps up to Johnny and Jeff says, hey, Johnny, I want to bring the core of who I have over to your production house. And I know that we have Dane Tudor. Solomon's his sponsor. Solomon's your title sponsor. We know they're going to pay for him. And you're able to seamlessly like go into that movie do you realize how big of an opportunity that is for you? Like, do you go into that season hyper-focused, like I'm going to put out the best edit possible? It's hard to remember, but I would say yes. I mean, I always wanted to put out the best all-round film segments ever since I was younger. That was my goal and focus. So moving up to PVP with Jeff, and that was really what I was focused on. And I guess it all just came together. Is a highlight of that first year when you get the call from Douglas to head to Alaska with him and Abma? And like when you get that call, is it like, holy shit, I've arrived? <laughs> I don't think I really thought of it that way. I guess like in the sense of, if, you know, we were talking earlier about confidence or being cocky or whatever. Like in a sense, it's just like, obviously, I was super grateful to have the opportunity to go and ride with Mike and Abma, like two top dogs in the skiing world. And to be able to learn from them was really awesome opportunity for me. But at the same time, it's like, it makes sense that that would happen. You know what I mean? As a young kid coming up in the ranks and skiing super well and creating a name for oneself, like that kind of stuff's going to happen. And it happened for you and you hear about the pucker factor in Alaska. 
And when you get there and you get dropped off for the first time and you're looking down pretty much a vertical terrain, what's that like for you? Well, we started out in this place called Spine Cell. It's outside of Girdwood and uh, Super Six Zone. And the first lines that we dropped on were actually like kind of smaller on the side of the main face that we were going to ski, but they were steeper. And so the first thing I noticed immediately was you can't really see anything because, you know, you're standing on top of this super steep slope and everything rolls over and, and drops off. So my initial thought was like, oh, I can't see anything up here. And then I think I ski down and probably white room myself. I think that I made it down the line. No problem. It was a bit like low light or whatever. And so that was kind of my first experience to really being white roomed on big mountain terrain. So those were kind of my two initial learning experiences. And then I think the next day or within days, we went to the main face and I got to ski this beautiful big spine straight down the main center of the zone. And it was really clean. So it was just like banging turns down that. And I then picked out this other line that had a pretty big cliff drop at the bottom and stomped that as well. And looking back on it and looking at the size of that drop, I'm still like, damn, that one was big. It's time for my second round of sponsors, and Elan Skis doesn't need to sponsor this podcast in the summertime, but they do it because they understand the importance of cultivating the stories that make the snow industry what it is. So while they're cultivating stories off snow, on snow, Elan is building a cult following here in the U.S., and there are a few reasons for that. First is that the award-winning Ripstick line has proven time and again to make you a better skier. The reason why? Elan uses the best materials known to man, and that's no joke. This is the same Elan known for building award-winning luxury yachts. So there's never any cutting corners and the fit and finish is better than anything else on the ski wall. Just look up and down and compare your Elans to anything else and you'll see the difference. The second reason why Elan's selling more skis in the U.S. is their Playmaker line. Yep, Elan has a line of twin tips that will go head-to-head with anything on the mountain. They're light, they're lively, and they're built better than any other twin tips on the wall. I'm skiing the 101 and it's been my daily driver for two years and they're so much fun. Before you buy your next pair of skis, please demo a pair of Elans or just head on over to elanskis.com, pick up a pair, and trust me, you're going to elevate your skiing experience. My final sponsor this round is Stanley, the iconic Northwest brand that invented the category of keeping things hot and cold over 100 years ago. You remember Stanley from your grandfather's green thermos that kept his coffee hot and cold forever when he took you out on adventures. Well, Stanley still makes that bottle and so much more. I know you know this because they are absolutely blowing up all over the world. With Stanley, you can think tumblers, water bottles, barware, camping utensils, coolers, vacuum bottles. There really is something for everyone. And you aren't going to find them overpriced like a lot of copycat designer brands that have popped up recently. Stanley is the originator and they pride themselves on providing you with the best products at the best value. And that value gets even better when you shop with my code. That's right, when you head on over to stanley1913.com and go shopping, when you check out, enter the code SNOW30, that's all one word, the number 30 and no spaces, and you'll get 30% off your entire order. Those are my sponsors, now let's jump back into the podcast. When you think about it, you're put on these peaks and you have to ski a gnarly line because that's what you're paid to do, that's your job. I mean, you never take an easy line, I would think, so are you always scared up there? Yeah, there's always some form of nerves going on for sure. Back then when I was a kid, I was learning a lot. And it's kind of hard to remember now what I felt like at that time. I think, again, I was just so stoked to be up there and live in my dream that there was a chance that maybe I wasn't that nervous. How about the park segment? So this is 25 years ago. Were those jumps some of the biggest ever built at the time? Because I feel like they were. And what's more scary, like hitting some of those jumps or just a, a big AK line? I think it was more like 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, 15 years ago. You're right. Yeah, yeah. But hitting the park jumps, they were huge for sure. I actually flew from Alaska straight to Oregon and went to Mount Hood and Ski Bowl there. And again, it was kind of like just riding the high, going from AK straight to Ski Bowl to a poor boy's park shoot, which again, I would just like always love the park shoots in PVP films. So it was another dream come true for me to be there. And being there with all the homies like John Spriggs, Matt Walker, Nick Martini, Jossie Wells, like just such a stacked crew of riders and also great filmers, uh, Pete Alport, Cody Carter. And I don't really remember on the filmer side, those are kind of the two, I guess Jeffy might've been there, but yeah, it was sick. That was where I did my first dub 12 on the ski bowl jump. I'd 
don't remember if I'd done the hand drag dub nine. I must have done that already. But yeah, I did my first dub 12. I was trying dub 10 and just went to dub 12. And then I tried it again and smoked my head and kind of got concussed. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty wicked time for sure. And when you think of your part in Every Day is a Saturday, it had a little bit of everything. And thinking about all the different types of terrain that you've put yourself in, and it doesn't have to be just for Every Day is a Saturday because these are going to be pretty general questions. But can you describe your worst ever Alaska crash? I don't think I've had any like super bad crashes in AK. I had one fall at Chatter Creek when I was skiing with Kai Peterson and Logan Peota for Numinous. And popped this nice air and I landed and just kind of like punched forward just the slightest bit, which kicked my back leg out. And I tried to balance it out and I ended up going down. And since my legs were split and I was tomahawking pretty fast, that really reefed on my hips. And that one I'd say would probably be my worst big mountain crash. And then let's think about your worst park crash. I mean, what's your worst park jump mishap? So, I mean, a funny one, something that is memorable for me definitely is that ski bowl. There was like an X jump. It was two like really sharp BMX style doubles. They were fully cut out, walled out. And I don't think I'd even hit them. And I didn't like the jumps that much, those two. And I went to guinea pig it and it was sticky coming in. And then it had been salted after that, like going into the takeoff. And I went too fast and completely overshot the jump to flat and shit my pants a bit and made my knee pretty sore. And I just got up and I had poo in my pants and I just kind of like hobbled off and went back to the place we were staying. That's a pal movement. Perfect story right there. But back to that first year with Poor Boys Productions, you got so much killer footage. When filming's done, do you have any idea what you have in the can? Yeah, for sure. I mean, to some degree or another, you're definitely always logging it mentally. And Jeff would make really cool mini edits when we would get some good footage. So I was always getting to see little bits of it here and there throughout the season. Yeah, it was super fun filming with Jeffy on those projects. And uh, he's a great filmer and really edits super well. I had no idea that I was going to have opening part or the level of impact that it was going to have for myself and the sport. Are you at the world premiere? Yeah, that was my first premiere. So when you go there and you see it and your opening segment, I mean, what are the emotions going through your head? Again, that was such a sick year for me, for sure. Like I skied urban with Tanner Hall, rode Whistler Backcountry with Charlie Yeager, Brandon Kelly, Riley LeBeau, and skied park with Spriggs and all those guys. Went to Alaska with Abma and Douglas. and when I saw the movie start and it starts with a black screen and Tanner starts talking and then the, the action comes on and then it's me there and Tanner's talking about me and my skiing and I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> I was blown away for sure. Like I was just, you know, he starts out saying something along the lines of, you know, he's really focused on all aspects of skiing and that's what I really like to see. And then my name comes on the screen and I'm like, damn, that is Tanner Hall talking about me on opening seg of the movie of Poor Boys Productions. Like it was pretty wild. That's amazing. And then the movie award nominations come out and you're up for breakthrough performance, part of the year, male performance of the year, everything I think you're up for. I mean, is your mind blown at that point? Like, holy shit, everything I've worked so hard for is actually happening in year one of being in a big production. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the time, I don't even know if I was really that aware of film awards. I just remember my team manager, Tyler Gig, at the time, super great manager. He was like, yo, dude, you really got to come out to IF3 in Montreal. I was like, okay. And I show up there and go to the awards and win best male performance. And I go up to the podium and schmuck before I, I stand up on the podium, he goes, you know who won this before you? And he's like, Tanner Hall. And I'm like, holy <laughs> fuck. You know, it's just kind of like, it always kind of, in a sense, comes back to Tanner. Like, he's so iconic and still pushing it today. And so to be following up, you know, winning the award the year after him was iconic for me, for sure. And so I would say winning that award and just that whole year, it kind of provided you with the cheat code that every skier really wanted, but no one could find. 
which was to not have to compete to prove yourself that you could move right into filming and you don't have to do anything else but film. And at 19 years old, that was really hard to do in professional skiing, but you made that happen right away. Did you realize that then? For me, it, it was just natural. You know, I grew up skiing Red Mountain and filming and, you know, I did the big mountain comps and ski races and stuff, but my side of it was filming and I wasn't, you know, riding park and stuff. And at the time, I think all kids were putting out some form of edit here and there, whatever. But I think Mike Douglas really picked up on the videos and things that I was putting out. And same with Tyler Gig at the time, who was the team manager. And it just seemed really natural for me. So did I know that everybody was trying to walk that path at that time? No, I didn't. I still find it interesting because like, you know, I did go to the park to try to get sponsors to bring back to the filming side of things, which is kind of ironic because I've talked to other athletes over the years and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm on the world tour because I want to be a film skier. It's like, well, you should go be a film skier then. So yeah. it's kind of funny that I did go to the park to try to get sponsors to do film skiing stuff because it makes more sense to just pursue the side of the sport that you want to be good at and people will notice that. I would say for you, it worked like that. For Seth, it worked like that. But there were so many people that had to compete and graduate from competing into filming. Like, I mean, Pep competed, you know, and like a lot of those guys competed for a couple of years, did well or did whatever, but built a following. And then they were able to stop competing as soon as possible and get into the film world. You really didn't have to do that, which is a tribute to what you were doing at the time. And you film for a few more years with Poor Boys. You win the Red Bull Cold Rush. You win the Skiers Cup. You're killing it. And then going into 2013, you signed with Scott. And Solomon had so many athletes at that time. I mean, was it that you got lost in the mix with them? Or what happened? Why did they not keep you when you're on top of the ski world at that point? Uh, I honestly don't know. So basically what happened was at the time... Solomon was moving a bit more towards like big mountain apparel versus like big baggy apparel, which at the time that was still what I was wearing, but I was ready to be making that transition to more technical based outerwear. And I tried to convey that to the manager at the time and they just really weren't going to sign me for outerwear. So I was going to be able to stay on board for skis and uh, like whatever accessories, boots, bindings, that kind of stuff, which I wanted to do. I wanted to stay with Solomon and Scott, they refused to do anything but head to toe as far as, you know, hey, let me wear your guys' outerwear and I'll stay on Solomon skis and boots and bindings. So I just went ahead with the Scott contract. Looking back on it, I don't really remember if I told Solomon, hey, this is what they're saying. Is there any way you guys can really counter this and we can make something work? Like, I don't really remember how I completed that negotiation. But uh, yeah, I ended up moving over to Scott. They were gung ho to have me on board. And I was stoked to be on their program for sure, but definitely would have liked to have stayed with Solomon for skis at that time. Like Solomon was a big brand for me. And, you know, like you said, they had an, a really amazing team at the time. And I definitely wanted to stay on board there as well as be with Scott. So it was a bit tough. And then you get on Scott and it seems like within like six, eight months of being on Scott, you have like the biggest injury of your career. What happens with the hip? Yeah, it's kind of funny that that happened like that. But uh, yeah, so I get on with Scott and I think that same year I get injured in January. I had an incident uh, about a week prior where I was doing a 180 off a cliff and ended up shattering a bunch of my teeth. I usually wear mouth guard all the time, but it was early season and I was stressed out with wanting to have a banger X Games video part because I'd been invited to X Games Real Ski and I had a lot of pressure on myself and, um, yeah, just was stressed out and ended up leaving my mouth guard in the truck because it wasn't fitting that well that day and shattered a bunch of my teeth. Shortly after that, I rode my sled around in the bowl and broke my A-arm on my sled. So I was out of there. And a week later, I tow out into the backcountry and I dislocated my hip after the second hit. And I was pretty aware that I was not feeling good and I had bad thoughts of injury and all that kind of thing running through my head. And I tried to call it off after the first hit, but our filmer at the time, he was kind of, you know, trying to motivate like, Hey, when's the next time you're going to have the opportunity to do this X games, blah, blah, blah. So that kind of helped push me into it a little bit. And I ended up dislocating my hip doing a to switch 180 on this like cliff drop pillow feature. And I still take full responsibility for the fact that, I made the choice to do it and I got helicoptered out of the backcountry, and it was a six hour journey to have my hip 
put back in and it was oh. incredibly painful it was insane like as soon as i landed and it popped out i was just screaming like a savage animal like completely convulsing out of control it was gnarly oh man that sucks so bad the good thing i guess with scott is that you have kevin cruz as your team manager you guys have a good relationship so you don't have to worry about losing a contract with scott and you can just focus on getting yourself ready to go film with TGR because that's the next thing you're going to do. But another thing you're going to do is you're going to redeem yourself because the 2014 season, you're invited back to the X Games real snow. And that first year, it was cool to be part of the X Games until you blew yourself up and you had like more pain than you've ever had in your life. But that second season was the attitude like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to win this thing. And when did you get the idea in your head that you could land a switch triple cork 12 in the backcountry? Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, going through the injury, uh, yeah, I had Kevin Cruz and Topher Plimpton as team managers, great guys, and super grateful that they continued to support me throughout that period. And yeah, came into the next year, had been training over the summer, doing weights and stuff like that, riding my bike and working my confidence level back up. And going into that year, got invited back to X Games Real Ski, and I was just super hungry for it. I guess I was out there probably to prove to myself that I could still do it. And, uh, yeah, I came back just super strong and did a switch triple cork first switch triple in the backcountry, which is pretty badass. And, uh, I love that trick. It's honestly been pretty easy for me to do when I decide to do it. Where do you attempt that trick first? So I started by doing a switch 12 at Mount Hood. I think I was still on Salmon, so that would have been like summer of 2012, maybe. Okay. Did a switch 12, because in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, okay, when I do a switch dub, it's basically just a switch nine with two off-axis rotations. So to do a switch triple 12, it's going to be a switch 12 with three off-axis rotations. That was the start to it. And then the next year in Breckenridge, I did a switch triple 12 on the freeway jumps yep. just like the the public park jumps i also did a switch triple 14 which i landed on my feet but was just slightly too compressed and kind of fell back and didn't ride it out i'd still like to do that trick and stomp it so we'll see if that's in the cards we'll see what happens there but uh yeah did it in breck it must have been 2011 2012 that i did it in same in 2012 for breck because i was still on solomon at the time and that trick and that whole edit gets you a silver medal at the X Games. And I think that's there's the second most important silver in all of skiing if you look at the Olympic silver as, as the most important. And what's that experience of winning an X Games silver medal like? I mean, do they make it feel like you won an X Games medal or do they just FedEx you a, a medal in the mail? <laughs> at the time, yeah, it was just a FedEx medal in the mail and I got some pictures taken. I mean, that's kind of the way it's done. I mean, it's obviously an amazing accomplishment and something for me to be like, yeah, I am an X Games medalist. And that means a lot to me for sure, because I always wanted to compete in X Games and to be able to do it in the arena that I actually am best at was really cool to have that opportunity. And uh, I've got it hanging on the wall right next to me here in my office. Nice, nice. And then from there, you film like six movies with TGR and then eventually TGR ends. And it's usually when that happens, it's sponsor related, but I don't know. Why did you stop filming with TGR? Yeah, it's uh, totally sponsor related for sure. I enjoyed my time with TGR, you know, got to ski with Ian Mack. And I don't know if I ever was on a trip with Sage or not. I always wanted to ski with Sage, have skied with him, but I don't know if we ever did a film trip together. I skied with Mack and Griffin Post a lot. Did uh, all kinds of stuff, really skied big mountain lines, uh, camped and climbed and skied Alaska lines. I did lots of backcountry trick skiing with guys like Dash Long. I skied a lot with Nick McNutt, who was uh, really fun to ski with. And yeah, just really came down to sponsor things. I'd still be skiing with TGR now if I had the opportunity. So at this point, when you realize Scott's not going to buy you into the TGR movie, are you kind of like stressing out. I'm like, what am I going to do next season? I need to find a project to be a part of. So basically it kind of went along the lines of when I didn't film with TGR for the first year, the guys at Scott kind of pushed me into doing my own thing. So they're like, Hey, we want you to do some YouTube stuff, make a movie, that kind of thing. So I went out and filmed a movie with a friend of mine up and comer named Simon Hillis before he really got into the game, so to speak. So I kind of went out and mentored him in the backcountry 
we did three different trips of around two weeks in total camping out of my trailer and filming with a guy named Tim. Tim. See, this is where my, my brain blanks. Okay. We'll just call him Tim. <laughs> Got it. Anyway, so I uh, did that. Tim's a good homie of mine. And then the next year, Scott, they wanted more of that YouTube stuff. So they're like, hey, can you do like a web series and also put together some how-to videos? So I did a web series and did some how-to videos. And then I was like, hey, I don't know, not really feeling that vibe. Let's go back to TGR. So I got to go back to TGR for a year, I think. And then the final year, there just wasn't enough money available. So I was able to film with blank that year is what I, I was able to push Scott into at the time. And it's weird because with blank, I mean, they have like a super tight crew of guys. And I was talking to some of those guys and they said that like you had called up and said, hey, can I be part of this project? And they're like, we have a super tight crew right now. And then like two weeks later, Alexi and Stan get hurt and you guys converse again. And they're like, yeah, dude, you're going to be in this movie. Do you have to get Scott to buy your way into the movie? And are they like willing to pony up money to support you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Scott definitely supported the blank film and made it happen. I don't know exactly what the level of budget was there. And I know what I worked with as far as my budget was concerned for like the travel aspect of it. And uh, yeah, it was definitely shoestring for sure. But super grateful that Alexi had me as a part of the film. And it was super fun to get back out there filming with the Whistler crew, filming with Jeff Thomas again, and ended up winning Best Male Performance again at IF3 15 years later, which is just like super amazing. And it's kind of funny to have done it really with in a way, the same crew had that opportunity to win the award, you know, filming with Jeff Thomas and big shout out to Alexi for giving me that opportunity. I mean, it is incredible that 15 years later, you're able to replicate what you did at 19 years old, which is so incredible. And I can imagine that's like so special because you've had so many ups and downs along the way. And then you're able to land that award. And what I want to believe is that Scott comes back and gives you a great contract because you got that award and you prove that you're back. You're back with blank and you have all these other sponsors that jump on too because you've proven that Dane Tudor is not old. He has just reinvented himself. But did that happen or, or what happened with sponsors and movies and shit like that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think that's what we would all like to believe, but definitely didn't go that way. Scott did come back and they did offer me a contract for the year. It was lower than the prior year that I had worked with Blank. You know, I don't know why. Maybe it's just the company was changing direction. They wanted a younger athlete like, you know, they're free to do whatever it is that they want. We did renegotiate the contract back to the same amount that I had skied for blank. And then it just came down to a little bit too slow on the trigger. And when I went to sign the contract, they had cut off all their funding budget because they were worried about a recession or something like that. And that was the end of it. But since then, I actually was able to reach out to the TM and he sent me a brand new pair of skis, new outerwear kit and some goggles, which is super cool. Get to try out the new ski, the Scott C which I had a lot of fun on here riding the resort a few about a week ago. And yeah, still grateful to have the opportunity to get some product. And, uh, you know, of course, still hopeful that uh, I can revive the ski career. But yeah, it's been pretty challenging. So we'll see. Yeah, I feel like with you, you would have been like the perfect athlete for an agent in your career because it would have been nice having someone advocate for you on all walks of life and not having to hear what other people had to say about you and not having to reply back to what other people had to say about you. To have a, a manager do that for you, you didn't, you kind of managed your career on your own. And I know these days, you know, you ski a shit ton. You're also a day trader and you haven't given up on a pro career, but what is it? 50, 50 that you can sign more sponsors and have the travel that you did at 25 again, maybe. Yeah. So as far as agents are concerned, I did talk to a few agents over the years. I, when I was down in the park scene and stuff like that. And yeah, none of them seemed to want to pick me up. I don't know, like, I feel like I've had little bits along the way that have like, you know, I was super lucky to have that opportunity with every day is a Saturday and really blew up in that sense. And then at the same time, really struggled, say, to like pick up an agent or something like that. So there were areas in my career where I wasn't quite able to make sense of like, hey, why do these guys have an agent? But I don't like, why can't I pick up somebody that's going to help with that realm? But that's just the way that it went. And honestly, now I'm not really like super active and 
reaching out to companies. I do have the guys at Pangea Creatives. Uh, I'm on board with them. Noah is doing his best to communicate with different companies, but definitely the sponsorship landscape has changed and we'll just have to see. I'm kind of sick and tired of reaching out to all these companies trying to get on board. Like, If you want the skill set that I have, then let's make something happen. But otherwise, like, I'm not really interested in like reaching out. It's just at some point, it's just too much. It's like, I'm not 14 years old trying to get a sponsor anymore, but that's what it feels like. So yeah, it sounds like you're trying to get laid. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty funny. (laughs) But you know, it is what it is, whatever. All right. Well, at this point, we've been going for a while and I need to get to the part of the show that I call inappropriate questions. This is where I get someone you know to ask three questions and they can be anything. This week, I was able to get a kid that you grew up with, a former pro skier, a former reality TV star, and an all-around good guy, Colston VB, to ask the questions. And are you ready for question number one from Colston? Yeah. Here we go. All right. So I'll set the stage a little bit first. So it's early 2000s. Dane's probably 12 or 13. He's like the ultimate Grom, like maybe the most talented skier ever for his age. He knows it. He's a little bit lippy. He's a bit of a punk kid. You know, he's got his ginger hair dyed black. I don't think he ever touched up the roots. You know, he's wearing the full Oakley puke camo kit. And basically, you know, he's so good. He's he's skiing with the older kids. He's skiing with the like late high school kids that are also really good. And then he's kind of relaying what he's doing with them down to us. So, um, you know, with that bit of cockiness, he was kind of in a place where you know, they were a little bit jealous. He was getting these sponsorships and stuff. So they would kind of humble him a bit and they'd like haze him in certain ways. So my question is, what are the worst things that those kids did to you at that time? And what were the most inappropriate things you were doing for your age with those kids? Yeah, I'm going to name them. There's Wiener and Dono and a few others, but those guys are legends. Awesome dudes to this day. So they need a shout out. But yeah, it was a pretty sick little dynamic we had back in the day for sure. All right. That's question number one. Man, that is hilarious. That's a hard question to answer. But I mean, I can answer like something that was not related to Colston. But when I was younger and I was ski racing and maybe I did it to Cole and those guys, but I definitely love to like hack skis on the chairlift. Like I think I just had a lot of energy and I would just like basically just take my edge and just hack whoever's sitting next to me's top sheet. Like I, it was just an energy thing i think for sure yeah so that was pretty rough for the kids sitting next to me on the chair and i i was definitely like bouncing the red chair lift like swinging the chair probably almost derailing the chair i was jumping off the silver load chair lift colston i definitely like pushed to the point of crying a couple times when he would be on a cliff and he was scared and i'd just be filming him and i wanted to go and it's like go dude let's go and i just was always giving him a hard time and dono and wiener his name actually is kevin Irwin. a couple of the older guys that i looked up to dono was always picking on me he was punching me and all that kind of stuff like those guys never wanted to ski with me and i was just chasing them around the mountain i had my first beer with them probably when i was like 14 well, i don't even know how old 14 <laughs> maybe and at the time aaron alabon who was the filmer his girlfriend i think i like liked her at the time or something and one night i went over to their place and maybe she like gave me a kiss on the cheek or something like those are some of the things i can remember all right well we will jump into his question number two all right question number two i was not here for this but i was told that one time you went so big on a jump that you shit your pants upon impact (laughs) so i kind of want to know all the details i want to know what were your first thoughts were i want to know what the people around you did, how you reacted, how you managed the situation, where the dirty long underwear ended up, everything that happened that day, I want to know about it. So I think you talked about shitting your pants a little while ago, but he's got a lot of other questions that go along with it. Is this the same shit your pants story, first of all? Yeah, absolutely. Same story. So, I mean, I'll just reiterate it real quick. Overshot that jump at Ski Bowl shit my pants my knee hurt for sure like bad i like got up limped off was like dude i just shit my pants and i don't think i said anything to anybody i don't know how i got out of there but went back i was staying with cr johnson actually we were rooming together and maybe i don't remember who else was with us and i feel like i just 
threw my boxers out the back window of the place we were staying in government camp. Like it was a pretty rundown spot. And like, I was like, I can't like have these in the room. So I just fucking ditched them out the back. Nice. All right. Well, we're going to jump into his final inappropriate question. Who was Laird and describe your ongoing beef with Laird. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. So Laird Carmichael, he was operations manager at the time when Cole and I were growing up. And Laird just always seemed to be super pissed off. And so he would just shut down every jump we would build, like all the ski patrollers, even like all the older ski patrollers that are still around, they'll tell that story. Oh, Dane, he'd be out there. We'd be shutting him down, building all these jumps. And uh, yeah, definitely had a major problem with Laird because, you know, Cole and I'd be trying to build jumps like on the side of the T-bar or wherever we thought would be a good spot. And then the patrollers would always be showing up. Laird says, you have to tear this down. And I don't remember what my reactions were, but as a young kid with a lot of energy, I'm sure I wasn't too happy with that. It's actually funny. There's a guy named Eric Colossus, and he recently told a story about a young punk kid that came into his office. He was the manager of Red at the time and said, hey, the ski patrol keeps tearing down all my jumps. And I guess I wanted him to stop that or whatever. I don't, I don't know. You the, reported the him. Whole story, but yeah, I went in there to Eric and was like, "Yo, dude, they keep shutting down all my jumps." Oh man, that's amazing. So that's inappropriate questions, and that's the podcast. And your story is interesting to me, mainly because of the attitude part. I mean, when I heard about it, I was like, "Obviously, you're an incredible skier," but there's a lot of incredible skiers. But I kept thinking, what made you cocky as a kid? And then thinking about it after this podcast, maybe you weren't that cocky, but. The first thoughts that I had was like, well, he didn't have a dad around. That could be part of it. And then I think the continued success is another part of it because I'm sure everybody was telling you how great you are your whole life because you're always the best kid. But even though things were so good in the ski world for you, it seems like things were never as easy as they should have been for you. Like sponsorship and film parts and everything. They should have been easy, but they weren't. The skiing part was the easy part. But really, what do I know? I just talk to people. I will say that you've been killing it at the highest level over many different disciplines within a sport for over 15 years. You've traveled the world. You've lived more than most. And that said, I hope to see you in the movies for years to come. And I want to thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and really appreciate the opportunity. So that was time with Dane Tudor. And for all that dude has delivered and all the awards that he's won, He doesn't really have an income coming in from ski sponsorship. And I don't know Dane really that well, so I don't know if his personality clashed with his team managers, whether he rubbed some people the wrong way, who knows. But what I do know is that everything should have been easier for Dane based on his performance year after year, but it hasn't been that way. So these days, Dane isn't chasing the dollar skiing as much as he should be. He's got his own content creation business, Shredhouse Media, and you can find out all the things that Dane is doing over there. Check it out. That's the podcast. At this point, it's time for the review of the week. And this one is a five-star review. It's titled Episodes with Women, and it's by Brandy Kill. Here's the review. Mike, you've been hitting it out of the park with all the women you have interviewed over the past year. Wendy Fisher, Ingrid Backstrom, Rachel Burks, Michelle Parker, Maggie Voison, Elise Sogstead, just to name a few. The range of topics from racing, big mountain skiing, the Olympics, to bathroom issues with a toddler have all been amazing. Keep it up. It has been rad. I think we need Michaela Schifrin, Breezy Johnson, or Jackie Peso episodes soon. Well, I will say that I have had Jackie Peso on the podcast. I did talk to Michaela Schifrin's people. They told me that an hour of her time was way too much to give anyone, and Michaela just doesn't have an hour in her day. That's how she operates, which is a total crock of fucking shit, because everybody has an hour in her day, but her people wouldn't let me talk to her and wouldn't connect me with her. So maybe I'll run into her somewhere sometime and I'll get a podcast with her because if she's going to be on any ski podcast, it should be this one, the most important podcast in skiing, in my humble opinion, and it might not be so humble. But thank you very much for noticing that I've been putting a lot of women on the podcast lately. I still am slacking. I still need to keep it up and have more women in the mix. Equality is important and it's time we start all understanding that. So thank you for your review. For sending that in, you can email me at mike at thepowellmovement.com. And I will send you something awesome. Hopefully it will be branded by the Powell Movement, but I'm not sure yet. I don't know what I have. So please email me and I will send something to you. Thank you for that review. For anybody else that wants to review the podcast, well, it's easy. And I'm going to try to let you know off the top of my head how to do it. First, you're going to want to grab your iPhone. You're going to look for that purple icon that says podcast, and then you're going to hit it. 
when you hit that, then you're going to search for the Powell movement and you're going to scroll down to where you see the Powell movement. Then you're going to click that. Then you're going to scroll down to where you see reviews. You're going to click five stars if you think I deserve five stars, which you better. And if you want to write a review, that's greatly appreciated too. That's the only way I'm going to send you something if you write something out. And that's really all you need to do. It takes about 30 to 45 seconds. I highly appreciate you doing it. It does help the podcast move up the charts in the old algorithm. I don't know how that works, and I'm not really even going to think to try to explain it to you. But I thank you for doing it. I thank you for listening. And I thank you for supporting my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Outdoor Research, Best Day Brewing, and Elon Skis. Have a great week, everyone.